Christopher, should we start by talking about the recent European elections and indeed um, at the risk of um, this coming out after new events have made this out of date, why do you think Le Pen has been the seemingly triumphant figure from these elections? Yeah, I, well, I'd say, you know, it's, it's Le Pen's party. I think she's pursued this strategy over the last um, five years of uh, of uh, dédiabolisation, as they call it in, in, in France, or what, what you call it, of, of um, undemonizing her party, I think. I mean, you had a great de-demonization in England about, uh, in Britain about 15 years ago with, with David Cameron, but this is a much more, this is a much more, more thoroughgoing image makeover. Mm. The National Front has a, you know, a reputation, um, uh, not always deserved of being a, a party of what they call in France, the extreme right. That's the way it's called, um, you know, in the newspapers, it's, you know, it was founded in the 1960s around a lot of um, um, uh, decolonizing struggles. Uh, Jean-Marie Le Pen, who founded the party, was the guy who who wanted France to to stay in in Algeria. And, and the party has come to be associated with a lot of, uh, let's just say, noxious things. Marine Le Pen took over the party in about 2011, I think, and with the, with the with the goal of making it acceptable to middle of France, the middle of France, and now she's done it. But I'd actually say if there's a triumphal figure in the election, it would be Jordan Bardella, which is the he's the 28 year old mm. guy who was kind of an unknown quantity until you know until the legislative elections of of four years ago, who's uh, who's now the top politician in France in a way. He could be prime minister. I mean, okay. I, I think we won't. Um, we won't have another French. Pr- Macron has said that no matter what happens in these legislative elections, um, uh, that he is not going to resign as president. Okay. You know? okay. So, so what would have you know? So you would have, uh, you know, and this is one of the complications of French politics. Bardella looks in good shape to be the largest party in these legislative elections. Just how that would work out in a in a French, whether that would give him a majority in the um, in the assembly is hard to say. The, the 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 National Front or the the National Rally, as the party is now called, um, has never come close to that. But you know, it's really complicated by this sort of. It's a you know, it's kind of a mix of a system. It's like uh, it's not a pure parliamentary system like Britain, and it's not a pure presidential system like the United States. And it's hard to. There's a kind of a, a, a funny hinge between the two parts of the system. So, so, Ma- but Macron will, he assures us, will still be there until he's, you know, until he has to step down in 2027. What is um, Macron's position on um, mass immigration? You sometimes hear um, mainstream French politicians say things that in the Anglosphere would be considered very right wing on immigration, and yet France does have very high net levels, nevertheless, of net migration, no? This is a kind of an interesting election because there, there are a few things that really tick people off, all right? There's immigration, as always. Macron has always promised to raise the retirement age. He really wants France to, rhetorically at least, he, he, he wants France to be fiscally responsible. And he, and he, which is something that the the French public do not want. Mm. They are seventy five percent against the raising of the retirement age, and they've always said they are. And yet he did it last year, and he did it through a kind of a tricky parliamentary maneuver. I don't want to get into too much, you know, detail. But that's that's the second thing besides immigration. And I'd say the third thing is that he's got a kind of he's really. You know, he wound up being in the center of French politics when the party system was collapsing. So he's got, he's been able to hold power with about uh, with about thirty five percent of the vote. But the people who don't like him really don't like him. He has a real, I mean, he really gets people in an absolutely you know visceral way. If you can think of the way that you know the people who don't like Boris Johnson or the people who don't like Donald Trump. 
the way they felt about him. It's like 60% of the French public feels this way about, about Macron. So it, there's a real, there's a real, it's a visceral um, opposition to him. Now, I think that immigration in France has really developed in a special way under Macron because Macron, Macron's not a very experienced politician in this sense. He's a, there's a lot to compare him to uh, Boris Johnson with, you know what I mean? That is, he's got certain good instincts, but he's only been around this job for about five or 10 years. So it's, it's a funny way. He's risen to a very high level without a whole career of experience, but he's a good manager. What he did with immigration, he understands that rhetorically the French want a hard line, but he's not really an anti-immigration politician. So what he did uh, last fall at a time of tremendous tension, when there was a, you know, there was a stabbing incident in the, the Drome, you know, which is just south of Burgundy. It was in, in a country village and the, the, the country was absolutely despondent over migration. There, there were lots of stories about the huge budget shortfalls that are being caused by migration. And so Macron decided to pass an immigration bill without really wanting to limit immigration. So he, he got this bill through, through the National Assembly that would limit immigration. But then his constitutional council declared the conservative parts of it unconstitutional, you know? So you had like, you had a bill that was a mix of progressive and conservative measures on, on immigration. But then due to a bureaucratic constitutional procedure, the conservative hardline parts were declared invalid. And that really ticked people off. And I think that that has really echoed into this election. You wrote in uh, Reflections on the Revolution in Europe um, that of all the countries in Europe that were most likely to see um, hot conflict, to see violent violence in the streets due to ethnic conflict in Europe, you thought Britain was the most likely. And maybe you've forgotten because the book is a while ago now. No, 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 no. That's in, well, it's interesting because it, it changes with the with the cycles and 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 that book that book was written about fifteen years not not quite fifteen a decade or so ago let's say and um, you remember there were a, you, you know there were a number of you know bombings you remember the the um, young kids from Leeds who blew up a subway car you know yeah the, I certainly you know, do a lot of, you I know, was you know, a, in, I was in, a schoolgirl in, in London at yeah. the time yeah. Mm. I mean, at the time, the profile you would draw of, of Britain, um, and I, I don't see really much reason to revise it, is that, you know, Britain had a lot of reasons to be more optimistic than other, um, uh, than other countries about migration, which is it had a more, it had a more open economy. Um, so it's more like the United States in that you know, the migrants come, but most of them are actually, you can see them working very hard wherever they come from. It's a little bit less like the, like the European Union, like, like the continent of Europe, where, you know, migrants come, they're getting the, the asylum system, they're, they're not really in the workforce, they're eligible for welfare. And because they're eligible for welfare, they're not really assimilating. And I remember at the time I wrote that book, uh, there was an extraordinary statistic, but I thought it was quite reliable, which is that two thirds of the imams in France were on were on welfare. Mm. In Britain, you had people pushed into, you know, right into the middle of society um, uh, very quickly. Um, and another good thing was where you had concentrations of migrants at, and, and where they became naturalized as citizens, they quite naturally entered the political system. Um, in, in, in parliament. So in a place like Leicester, a Leicester is going to look like a country, that, like, like a city that's had high immigration over the last 50 years. And that's, and that's good. It's not like France where you have a problem of, you know, where, 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 where migrants simply don't show up in the, in, in the parliament. Okay. 
Um, so that's good um, um, for Britain. What's bad is that you had this, is that you had all sorts of, you know, radical groupings. And this, this, the, the book was written around the time of the, of the, of the Salman Rushdie, um, you, you know, fatwa and, and, and which has proved to actually be something really worth worrying about. And that, um, you had these radical currents developing in, in Britain, which certainly under new labor were indulged and even protected by, uh, um, by the, you know, uh, blasphemy laws. And it's, it's a very strange thing. So I, I, I thought that at the time that, that, that Britain is, um, Britain was in danger of, you know, sort of, sort of civil unrest. I would say that, um, I, I, I'm not sure that things have changed so much except, the, except for two things over the last 15 years. One is that, that, the continent of Europe has had such a huge wave of migration now that there are other countries that, let's say, uh, are, are running similar risks. And then, I, I mean, countries that you weren't really thinking of as much 20 years ago, like Sweden. And the other thing that I'd say has happened is the particular, let's say, demographic pressure from the most excitable politically excitable part of the Middle East, you know, you, you, you know, has, has lessened. I mean, you don't have a population explosion going on in, you know, you know, Syria and, and Palestine and, and Egypt and these other places that we're creating. Migra Birth Algeria. rates are quite low in that part of yes. the region, right? Well, they're not low, but they've, but they've fallen. Yep. And we're not at the point now where, where, you know, we have a lot of, um, you know, young men in, 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 like, say, between the ages of 15 and 30 who, you know, have, there, there's so many people in that age group that there are no, there's no room for them entering the job market in, in, in those areas. That period has passed in the Arab world. And that's in, so, so, so what we're seeing, what we're seeing in migration is like the, the heart of, of, of the demographic pressure from migration is it's it's shifting from the Middle East to sub-Saharan Africa now. So we'll have a different we'll have a different set of problems. But the, so the kind of unrest um, that I that I saw as possible in Britain 15 years ago, it's still it's still there, but it's not it's not at the forefront of the migration problem. Returning to France for a moment, my thought when I read that line was. My, I mean, Sweden is a fair point, but my money would actually be on France to be more at risk of that kind of violent conflagration, given what we saw last year, um, which, I mean, France does have a sort of noble history of rioting, <laughs> um, but, <laughs> yes, but. <laughs> but um, yep. it does seem as if, I mean, one of the things that I find sort of amazing, which you write about, of course, is that... Um, Islam in France and elsewhere, but I'm thinking particularly in France, seems to have an ability to cut across ethnic lines and to produce a kind of solidarity between, say, Arab youth and sub-Saharan African youth, which is actually really very unexpected and which you don't necessarily see in other contexts. But there's something about the deracinating effect of migration plus this universalizing religion, ideological system, which leads to, you know, for instance, you see video of rioting in the Bonneau in France and you see, you know, Arab and black young men sort of shoulder yes. to shoulder. It's all, it would almost right. be inspiring if it were, they weren't like mm -hmm. burning cars and so it's, on. Yeah. Yeah. There is a sort of a, a, a solidarity among people who feel themselves outsiders. I, I'm not sure how surprising I find that. I, um, I think that that's what um, fundamentalist um, Islam is meant to do. I mean, it's meant to unite people outside of particular cultures. There are, um, you know, certain societies um, that have a very heavy migration from one source. And um, when you 
certainly when you look at the mostly Muslim immigration to Europe over the last half century. Germany is the case par excellence. I mean, where the German Muslim community is primarily Turkish, you know. Um, and then Britain is somewhere in the middle. I'd say, you know, Pakistanis and Bengalis are the, the core of the British Muslim immigration. France is very, but, but even, let's stick with Britain for a second. Even in Britain, you know, a lot of people describe the sort of like, um, uh, Maududi was the big, uh, fundamentalist, um, um, uh, preacher in the subcontinent in the 20th century. And he's a, a person that a lot of the, um, the, the, the Pakistanis and, 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 and Bengalis who, who became more conservative followed in his teaching was always about discarding sort of like the accretions around pure Islam over the years. So like a, like a lot of the cultural stuff, a lot, a lot of the stuff that, 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 that people find charming or reassuring and, or, or familial, it was about identifying those, those cultural things and stripping them away so that you got the pure religion that you were doing what's, you know, what's in the Quran and not what's, you know, just not what has developed in certain village life over the last, you know, few centuries. And that actually makes it much easier. If people are stripping away their culture, it makes it much easier to, to focus on the, 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 the doctrine. Um, now, in a country like France, and I, I would say that France arguably has the most, you know, there's a heavy Algerian presence, presence but France is a kind of an immigrant mecca. I think that, um, yeah, the appeal of a um, something that says, "Look, our 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 cultural baggage is not the important thing; it's our beliefs." Because the interesting thing is that's an Islamic version of what the secular myth of France or the United States is actually all about. You know what I mean? It's like we're not, a, 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 you know, we're not a racial or a cultural. Um, uh, group, we are just, you know, this is, you just follow the American constitution and you belong here. This is kind of a religious version of that. Do you think that that is liable to produce serious conflict in France in the future, that clash between, I and mean, obviously the French, the native French majority is still large. We don't know how large, of course, because the French don't count it, but it's still large. Um, and has all sorts of advantages in terms of wealth and education and so on. But it does seem as if, you know, that, that, that term from um, Ibn Khaldun, as a buyer, this mm -hmm. idea of, you yeah. know, the binding ideology, it does seem mm -hmm. as if the immigrant youth in France and elsewhere really do have the upper hand when it comes to as a buyer. Yeah, it does. But these things, it seems that way, but these things, it always looks like, People, the, the, the further you get from yourself, the more it seems like everyone believes the same thing. I mean, it's very, the people you're conversing with every day and, 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 and you have an idea of their, their, their nuances. And, and, and I think when you, you, when you talk about people who are vaguely, you know, who are in some way distant from you, it does look like they're all saying the same thing. I think it's really hard to, I think it's really hard to judge where any country is going and I'm reluctant to, to, to predict. I could see, you know, as you know, it's, it's really hard to um, figure out just how many of, you know, how many culturally French people there are in France and how many, you know, culturally foreign people there are in France. And so what the, what the balance there is. I don't know if it will lead to, you know, to, to conflict or whether there's just like an actually a, a, a gradual process that, that is at work here that's going to just lead to the quiet eclipse of some of these cultures in Europe, you know? Yeah, meaning the eclipse of some of the native European cultures. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it, um, there's, an, there, there's a, a great attempt to, uh, you know, a lot of people in, in France, they talk about uh, le grand remplacement, you know, the great replacement. And that, that's considered, people describe that as a conspiracy theory and, 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 and that sort of thing. Um, but if you, if you are a, a, 
a native of the United States. And this is a, this is a country where, you know, it doesn't, the, the great replacements do happen. I mean, the sort of like the, 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 the place I'm looking at right now, you know, in, in, uh, you know, um, was once Indian territory and, you know, in the, um, you know, in the 17th century, there were no Europeans here. There were all, the only people who lived here were, you know, American Indians and, um, they're not here anymore. I mean, they're, they've gone somewhere, but they're, they're, they, in, in this locality, they have actually been replaced. I mean, and so that does, you know, whatever you think of the, the European situation, it is a, the, you know, a, 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 a people moving in and supplanting another. It is a, it is a possibility. It does happen in, 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 in history. I was reading actually recently the Wikipedia page on the Great Replacement Theory, which obviously is prefaced with this is a white supremacist conspiracy theory, yada, yada. But um, there was a section in Australia and it mentioned that Australia had had a, a period of, you know, that uh, my family are Australian, that the, the tipping point where um, Australian population became majority European was at some point in the 19th century and that this was kind of the first example of this happening, of course, to Australian Aborigines. Uh, how did that turn out? I mean, the number of Australian Aborigines now is actually larger in absolute terms than it was at um, first contact. Mm -hmm. But um, interesting. But yes, I mean, this. I suppose what's unusual, though, is that all of these examples that we're familiar with in terms of Indigenous people being displaced are um, a more technologically sophisticated culture and more populous culture coming into contact with a less technologically sophisticated culture. And that's not what we're seeing in Europe. Actually, there's not that clear asymmetry. It seems like, or indeed in America, it seems like this is more of a deliberate, if not a choice per se by governments, at least something that governments are passively permitting. Yeah, um, I'd want to think about that. Um, you know, you, I, this is something that you've written a, a, a great deal about, but I, you know, yes, governments are there is a degree of passivity with the governments but it's the it's the it's the social inability to uh, to re to 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 replace the next generation that is leading the government to scramble for sort of like ways to admit more labor and that kind of thing so there's something being generated at the level of the of the let's say you can say the national culture or you can say maybe the local community, or maybe it's the family, or maybe it's happening in the individual heart. This is something that, you know, what do you, where do you, where would you locate that? The, 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 the real, the real source of that deficiency. It's what Mary Harrington calls the great lack of self-replacement is actually what's going on, <laughs> right? It's the, it's the seeming reluctance of, Europeans and also European descended people in America and of course Northeast Asian countries I mean it's not just it's based, I mean well, I, everywhere yeah yeah my uh conclusion from looking at the data on birth rates worldwide is that there are obviously um you know Israel is an outlier there are uh, South Korea is kind of an outlier but basically the best predictor of whether or not a country stops having enough children to reproduce itself is um affluence just that more affluent you are the less minded you become it seems interesting to have can, children. You, can you uh, yeah the interesting question is how you control that for for religious belief i mean can you separate out religious de declining religion from affluence I mean. yeah well you can look at subcultures so um within yeah. france or uh britain or israel people who are more religious have have more children often a lot more children and there are some very very fertile subgroups um and the, and you can even see you know the frequency with which you go to church predicts how many children you're likely to have on average and things like that so it's a very very close relationship um, in terms of whether it's secular, it's possible, I suppose, that affluence for some reason causes secularization, which then causes low fertility. I don't quite know what mechanism. That's that's a hard thing to explain. I, I remember hearing the Oxford 
demographer, um, David Coleman, who, who in the United States, um, at a lecture about 15 years ago. And he, you know, at the time, this was, you know, Americans were like really, you know, proud that we were above replacement rate. The United States was growing at a healthy, you know, like a- attitude towards life, unlike the Europeans who were kind of decadent and their family size was shrinking, et cetera. And he said, actually, you know, there are about, there are like seven or eight sort of fertility subcultures in the United States. And he said, if you're from, I forget the, if you're from Texas, you know, you are indeed above replacement rate and the mothers are having like 2.3 uh, children a year. He said, if you're from New England, which is part of the country I'm from, if you're from New England, he said, you're, you're like a really infertile European country. You're not just out of the American sort of like level of, of, of replacement. You're like somewhere down around Spain. You're like in the low ones for the um, replacement rate. And that was a very humbling thing. And if you look at what's happening to the native population of New England, it is, you know, it's rolling itself up kind of like the, kind of like, the, you know, the, the native population in Europe. Yeah. I'm, yeah. Um, I'm six months pregnant right now. And I... Oh, that's lovely. <laughs> thank you. And when I go, we live in a part of London, which is... Um, has uh is certainly minority white british i mean the whole of london is now about a third white british um and is very bifurcated between um because as i'm sure you know white working class britons basically don't live in london anymore they all left over the last few decades but there are still um middle upper middle class white Britons living in London and then lots and lots of people from all sorts of different immigrant groups. There's no one, I mean, there are, there are obviously different parts of the capital which have different predominance of different groups, but basically there's a big mix. So I live in a borough which has a combination of um, middle-class white people and poorer immigrant groups of various from various places. And it's very apparent when I go to my uh, maternity appointments that the white middle class people are breeding like rare orchids. <laughs> There's just yeah, well, not like- very many of them at all in the waiting rooms. Um, mm-hmm. and, and part of this is because people tend to leave London when they start families um, for cost reasons and so on. But also, yeah, I mean, just... You can call the Great Replacement. It, it's not a conspiracy theory. Well, there's a conspiracy version of the Great Replacement Theory which says that it's been done deliberately by shadowy elites. But in a lot of senses, it's just it just seems to be a natural process that's happening whether or not we want it to. Yeah, uh, there there is a conspiracy version. I'm not sure that anyone actually holds the conspiracy version, though. I mean, the guy who invented the term was Renaud Camus, the, the, the French writer, who's a was a very good, it's a very interesting writer. You know, he was, a, I mean, he's, he's considered a great prose stylist. His expertise was in sort of like architecture and interior design and in, in French history. And so he wrote, a, he wrote a series of great books about like the interiors of Versailles and things like that. People love these books. He writes these diaries. He's like an incredibly prolific and literary and for most of his life kind of an apolitical you know uh fellow then he writes this this book the 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 great replacement which is just a few observations but also which is explicitly accompanied by frequent statements that like of course none of this is being planned at any central level or you know i don't believe this is any kind of conspiracy it's but it's just a it's a demographic pattern that it bears noticing and the 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 attempt to paint this as a conspiracy theory is actually it's putting words in his mouth you know what i mean of course there are conspirators in you know people who believe in conspiracies in the world but this is not he is not one of them 
Many of you will know that Christianity is a subject of fascination for me and the role of Christianity in shaping the modern world is a theme I return to again and again on the podcast. My view is that we really can't understand the world or ourselves without getting to grips with it, which is why I'm very glad to point you towards a new online course called 321. It's an introduction to Christianity that's imaginative, thoughtful, engaging. It assumes absolutely no prior knowledge. It's presented by the wonderful Glenn Scrivener, who has been a guest on the MMM podcast previously and I've also been a guest on his show. Glenn presents eight video-led sessions which are based around some beautiful animated stories that illustrate the Christian message. You can check it out for free at 321course.com forward slash MMM. Just enter your email, choose a password and you're in. There's no spam, there's no fees. Just visit 321course.com forward slash MMM. My impression from knowing people who work in government in ver- of various ideological stripes, is that um, it's not a conspiracy in the sense that people, anyone's planning it per se, but there is a strong feeling, at least within um, the centre, centre left, even centre right, um, that ethnic replacement of Native Europeans is um, at the very least neutral and possibly good. That se- that seems to be a very strongly held view. So it's not so much that they are designing any of this; it's more that they don't mind it happening, and if anything, and they think that they think that any criticism of it happening is is highly highly suspect. It's not happening, and it's a good thing that it is. Precisely, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. I know, and 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 um, and we have that in the United States too. Uh, you know. Ron Brownstein, who's a, a journalist, who's an absolutely he's an excellent. Um, political journalists, but when he describes the democratic coalition of, of basically rich, you know, uh, beneficiaries of the tech industry, plus, you know, uh, women and gays and, 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 and the children of immigrants, he describes it as the coalition of the ascendant, you know? So yes, there is that. So, yeah. So, I mean, cause <laughs> One view could be that this is that all of this is an inevitable consequence of not just birth rates being different in different parts of the world, but also the existence of the jet engine and the smartphone and all this technology that enables mass migration. You could see this in strictly materialist terms and say that this was inevitable. But then you do have to ask why this hasn't happened in Japan. Ah, right. Well, that's they have. Um, um... I was very interested to see in Japan many years ago. Japan has chosen, they, they, Japan has paid a, a very high economic price for their sort of having closed off certain aspects of their economy to the world, namely Im- immigration. It's been more important to them to remain Japan than to to remain prosperous. And 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 when I've been in Japan, I've noticed that, you know, in Tokyo, you see a lot of like, you you, you see occasional Starbucks type coffee machines and and that I'm sorry, coffee uh, cafes and that kind of thing. But in general, the way that espresso and lattes and that type of coffee has come to Japan has been through machines. That is, the, if you go in go into a small city, you get your your latte or your, 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 you know, your cold brew or whatever it is out of a big vending machine, you know, you notice it in diff- different other ways the, the the parks have become simpler. They're less elaborate. They, you know, they're, they're things that can be, can be, um, can be, can be dealt with in one like run of the lawnmower. You don't have people trimming around things it, it changes your society to, to to not have immigration but that's been their choice so japan doesn't have the we have these uh at the end of our road we have a hand car wash which you never when i was a child i remember going through the automated car washes and obviously they're extremely exciting when you're a child you never re, you never really see those now that it's overwhelmingly hand car washes in the uk I guess because and very and fairly miserable looking recent migrants staffing them because I guess there's a an abundance of that kind of cheap labor and so it's better it's better from an employer's perspective to do that than to automate. 
that well right and to automate is to is generally to increase productivity so this is not a it's not a good sign to go from machine labor to hand labor it's not the sign of a of a healthy it's not what we've been taught to think of as a healthy economic sign no i mean the thing is yes it is true that japan has paid a, an economic price and that they were they were regarded as being the next great superpower and that clearly hasn't happened and now they have areas of the countryside that are just emptying of people and so on but it's not as though britain's flourishing economically either i don't think that we've actually done better than japan in recent years in terms of our growth yeah it's very hard for a, for a foreigner to tell i you know um what you know in in past years I, I i've spent a lot of time sort of like roaming around the, the far north and the you know the south coast and places where there are you know where they're doing badly but for the, mo for the most part people sort of just go to the parts of britain that are that resemble their own globalized people stay in the globalized economy and that's why our our judgments about how well countries are doing uh, tend to be based on, on on a lot of optical illusions and the great writer who's who sort of really described this is Christophe Gilwe in in France. I don't know if you've ever read him, but he's really he's really superb. I mean, he um, you know he writes about he, he he writes about the world that produced the successes for the the National Front, and it's basically you know to really understand what's going on today, you need to know that you know the new economy really is. A, it's a new economy. It's basically an, a whole new set of transactions and things. And if you're an old, if you're not, if you haven't been hired into it, if you're not like sort of like writing code or, or, or making podcasts, then you don't really have any grip on the, on the world economy. And you're, and you're, and you're dependent on, you know, just scrap, just scraps of her from from here and there, and so who can belong to the world economy? It's kind of interesting, but you 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 know, this information revolution was supposed to to abolish space, and it wouldn't matter where any of us live. But it happens to matter a great deal. The thing that makes this a little bit of a uh, uh, hard to see is the fact that that we all know, you know, you know, we've all heard of you know investment bankers who live in vale colorado or who live in cornwall or who live in you know you know on the french riviera that, that these are better thought of as outposts of these sort of like capital cities and university towns that's where the economy is in that economy you know um you know who can live in those cities gil Wee's thesis and he used to be an expert on real estate was that two things happen in france you get you get, you know, um, rich people buy up all the housing stock in a in a in a hot neighborhood, and that's something that's happening in in London. You know, I mean, you know, you know, Stockwell, you know, Clapham. These were pretty modest places. Now they're like some of the richest, you know, neighborhoods in the in in in, in the world. So rich people buy up the entirety of the private housing stock, and in the public housing stock gets taken over culturally by people who are not by by the children of immigrants so it becomes sort of culturally strange to the working class so the the working class kind of gets spit out of these metropolises where the economy is happening and they wind up they're not like at the north pole okay but they're like 60 miles away and it's too far for them to commute and there's no getting back in, and um, and so so then, what happens is the people in the in the metropolises, contemptuous of the people who've been ejected from them, they do things like Macron did to, to discuss earlier. They say like, well, we want our metropolis to be clean, so we're going to ban diesel. I mean, so but, but these people who've been thrown out, they're now sixty miles away from where you know, from the global economy. And, they, and there's no public transportation where they live. So they need their, their car as their lifeline, you know. And so you get a process like this. And um, you basically develop two countries in 
in one country. You know, it's it's how it comes about that you know in a in the United States, nobody knows. You know, nobody in Washington knows anybody who voted for Trump, and they and and they very sincerely say, you know, look, they 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 say I didn't vote for Trump, and 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 you know, the nanny who takes care of my children who didn't vote didn't vote for Trump, and I've talked to all sorts of people, um, and they and none of them voted for Trump, so they, you know, so what so so what's going on? What's what's going on actually is the people who are outside of the global economy vote for Trump and the people who are inside of it vote against him. Yeah. The big question there is, um, so you can see why, of course, um, uh, working classes would end up being excluded from these very expensive capitals because of housing becoming more expensive. That makes perfect sense. The, the big question is why social housing or public housing or whatever you want to call it, government subsidized housing, ends up going disproportionately to migrants and their children. I mean, in London, that's a, the skew is extraordinary. It's like half of London social housing is the, the the lead tenant was born overseas. Very, very high proportions, and it does basically mean that there aren't really there are, there are, there are so few white working class people in social housing in London, particularly in some areas. And it is it just seems so odd that any government would do such a thing i mean to some extent people don't realize at least in britain people don't realize that this is going on and i do think it would be very much in reform's interests to inform people <laughs> this is going on because i think it would be a really really incendiary um as a political cause but um yeah why why would governments do such a thing what's is that is that well explained within the theory yeah, this is, yeah this is, it's funny i it's that's a hard question but it's one that i tried to address in uh in my last book, which came out um, a few years ago, um, The Age of Entitlement, which is more about, it's kind of like the European book, but it's, it's more about the United States. You know, in a lot of ways, um, if you have a, for a real lean, um, capitalistic um, society of the sort that we have set up since the 1980s, um, sort of penniless foreigners are much better workers than than natives who are really equipped with rights. You know, I mean, you are too young to to remember some of the things that I remember from from my childhood. But you know, the American the layoffs at the um, at, at 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 American factories, the 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 British labor unrest leading up to the to the miners' strike. There was generally a feeling that. Um, our working classes had grown. It, it, this was widely shared in 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 um, in the middle of the the society. The feeling grew that our working classes had just sort of grown so pampered, and that they had actually priced themselves out of the market. And and sort of you know you you know people would say you know can you believe that a guy who who you know screws rivets at the General uh, Motors factory gets like eighty thousand dollars a year people would say you know and you get six weeks of vacation and it and it all you know unionized labor was much more it was absurdly overcompensated relative to to, to the kinds of jobs other people had and so the these sort of like special these really high salaries and 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 special benefits that that the working classes had got, they were resented by uh, that the organized working ha classes had got. They were resented by other parts of the working classes who voted Reagan and Thatcher into into office, um, and that led to deregulation. Of course, it led to you know basically the whole point of offshoring was not taking advantage of sort of efficiencies that were already out there. It was basically fleeing regulation. It was fleeing, you know, high salaries and mandatory benefits for workers. Because, you know, you could build a car with ten thousand dollar a year employees. You didn't need eighty thousand dollars dollar a year employees. And so all these jobs went. And now what did we have? Everything I mean the two great deindustrialized 
societies are the United States and Britain. So what what do we have now? We have a society in which you're either investing or you're you're making other people's coffee. Now, if your average working class person is someone who's making other people's coffee for close to minimum wage, actually, who do you want in that job? Do you want some old guy who used to make $80,000 or 40,000 pounds a year screwing rivets? And he's really resentful that he now has to serve people. He who used to be an independent yeoman in the world he used to have a you know used to be able to stand on his own two feet now does this servile thing and he, he's not happy with it mm. or do you want the guy who comes from you know poland or morocco or wherever and it's like wow you know 10 pounds an hour for this that's good money i'm really happy to be here so so the the immigrant is it you know it's sort of like a you know um, one of these biblical type paradoxes: the the immigrant is a better native than the native. the The immigrant is more useful to to Britain as it's officially thought of by the government than than the the, Eng- the you know the the old Cockney, and it's the same in the United States. Yeah. It's just, yeah, it's just class warfare, <laughs> basically. <laughs> yeah. Or no warfare. It's just, uh, I, I don't really see the evidence. I see the beginnings of warfare in some of these votes, you know, in like the, you know, in the Trump vote and the Brexit vote. and the, the But I but I don't really see, huh, I don't really see any that the, the excluded have really been able to make a dent in the system. No, not really. I mean, Brexit is a beautiful example in that it was this seemingly this political earthquake and it was mostly driven by these people you described, but um, the government took it um, literally not seriously. And so they just excluded Poles and massively increased migration from other parts of the world. Brexit is a very curious episode. And, you know, in a, in a way it is the greatest uprising against entrenched privilege that has taken place in any Western country since the Second World War. It's a, it, Brexit is, is it, British people have such a have such a such an inaccurate idea of what matters about their country and what doesn't matter about about their country. Brexit is huge. Brexit was a bre- Brexit was a a a a, a world shaking event. But it's very interesting that that the British establishment just choose to declare it kind of non-receivable. It's like it didn't happen. It's just, it's, it's, and that's a very interesting, it's a very interesting lesson in how this order, which are, which a lot of citizens are discontent with can really absorb blows that would have toppled a preceding order, which is a sign that, its stability, its sources of power are somewhere else than the traditional sources of political power. Yeah, I think that um, I think that it's. I think you're completely right that the native elites until now have benefited actually enormously from mass migration, and they have no love really. There's no sense of noblesse oblige really directed towards the native poor. And particularly when you have this geographical splitting and people, you know, people in Westminster don't spend time in Clacton or in other, you know, parts of the country which are filled with the the kind of excluded natives. Um, and it's quite easy to just ignore, even to ignore Brexit. How amazing to have ignored Brexit and yet they, you know, they basically managed it. I, I, I wonder though, there are two things on the horizon or happening already which are going to make um, cause greater discomfort to people who are otherwise supportive of mass migration till now. One is um, it's post October seventh, and uh, the enormous protests in London and elsewhere. I think those have really shocked a lot of people who thought who who were other a lot of 
white people who were otherwise complacent about basically how servile these migrant groups were <laughs> and thought that they were much more ideologically aligned with um, Br British values, whatever those are, right, than they in fact are. Um, the other is, I think, the when it stops working economically, right? So when you actually, I mean, we, because our GDP has grown something like 0.2% in the last year, but because our population has grown a lot, our GDP per capita has in fact shrunk. And it's becoming increasingly notable, noticeable that Britain is becoming poorer. And so this promise of kind of pumping the system with lots of cheap labor to maintain growth is evidently not working and it's not working for the middle classes even. And a big phenomenon in London, it's also true elsewhere, but I think it's more true in Britain and London than elsewhere because we're so centralized around the capital, is that young middle class people whose parents benefited economically from this era cannot buy housing in the capital and cannot access professional jobs in the capital. And I wonder if those two things in combination is, are a bit of a wake up call to lots of people who thought that Brexit was really racist and shocking, <laughs> basically. Yes, I think they do. Yeah. I mean, you know, you ask why um, there's no sense of native, noblesse oblige towards the the native poor. And, and you know, we can't ignore that, that like the big projects have not really been about helping you know, helping the person in your national family. It's, it's over the past half century, our, 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 our main cultural project has been reaching out to the other. And, and my last book was about, you know, the, 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 the effect of civil rights, the, the sort of like the, the, the knock on effects, the many, many knock on effects of civil rights in, area, in the United States in areas that don't seem related to it. But I, I mean, there was the understanding in the US that, you know, like, well, I don't really have to, you know, take care of the poor in my neighborhood. We have a larger problem, which is the, you know, which is race relations. And um, one thing that, you know, um, this post October 7th thing does, you know, I, I understand it's a very complicated issue but it does move the 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 question of 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 the cultural questions of migration onto the terrain of prejudice and anti-semitism and that kind of thing and in a, in a funny way even though these are much more dangerous issues they're easier to talk about because they're in our this is our this is our idiom for talking about um about problems on the economic things you mentioned, you're quite right. I mean, earlier on, you mentioned the, you know, the hand, the, the hand washed, the hand washed cars, you know, um, that is a sign that we have, you know, 25 years ago, we had a shortage of manual labor. We had a working class that was kind of disacculturated to doing the kind of manual labor that an information economy actually creates much more of a of a demand for, you know, um, you, you know, you, you, you have, you know, a lot more wealthy suburbs, you have a lot more need for like landscape gardeners and things like that. And we couldn't provide it. And so it did add efficiency, but you know, the old saying was these people do the jobs that, you know, Americans or British or Italians won't do. And I remember having this conversation with Italians and he's uh, with an Italian guy who said, yeah, they do these jobs that, that Italians won't do. And, and that's why there are like, you know, 17 Senegalese people at the tower of Pisa selling the same selfie stick. You know what I mean? That's not a, that's not a labor efficiency. So basically this is all about balancing factors of production. Labor is a factor of production. We're glutted with it. We don't really need more of it. And, probably our um, economic policy should reflect it. It's interesting um, looking at going back again to the European elections that in um, Germany, for instance, and in other places, the real driver, it seems, of the vote for the 
I don't want to say far right parties because that's the that's what you inevitably see in like Reuters, and it doesn't seem they don't they never talk about far left parties. So let's say right populist parties. Um, the big driver is actually young working class natives. That was not true for Brexit. So Brexit was overwhelmingly driven by older voters. It could yet change in this country. I mean, I see. Um, oh, it will. Yeah, I see this a little bit happening on TikTok. <laughs> the number of like the number of um, Zuma fans of Nigel Farage on TikTok is quite remarkable. But why do you think there might have been a lag in Britain in terms of that youth engagement? The episode is not over. There is another maybe 30 minutes of content, but it is behind a paywall. If you would like access to that content, if you would like to show support for the show, pay subscriptions are what keep it on the road. Allow me to pay my producers, put food on the table, all that important stuff. The extended version of the podcast is available at my Substack, louiseperry.substack.com. That's where you can also find, as I say every week, bonus episodes, extended episodes, uh, the MMM chat community, all of this. Um, please sign up for a pay subscription. It makes such an enormous difference to my ability to keep producing the podcast and grow it even bigger, produce more episodes, all that good stuff. There are other ways that you can show your support for the show as well. You can rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. You can like us on YouTube. You can tell your friends and family uh, how much you like the show. If you find it valuable, all of these things make an enormous difference to our ability to keep making it. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>